So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Yuri Tromheny, and I'm going to be the chair for this morning session. Uh, but before I give the floor to Fakir Asad, who's going to be our first uh, speaker, I would like to kindly ask you to, when, when you ask your questions, please use the microphone so, to give a chance to our online speakers to hear what you are saying. And also, I would like to encourage our online participants to ask questions at any time. I guess it's okay with you. Absolutely. So please just unmute yourself and, you know, uh, fire the questions. And with that, um, I give the floor to Fakir. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. So it's nice to be here and thank the organizers. I don't know if they're here for, for the invitation. Um, so I landed this morning at four o'clock. So if you ask questions, I won't fall asleep. Uh, if you don't ask questions, I'll, I'll, I'll go. You know, when, I, when people are tired, they do different things. Some people, you know, talk very fast and nobody understands anything. Some people, you know, fall asleep. I have the tendency of talking very fast when I'm, when I'm tired. So it's your job to slow me down. I don't have to get to the end. Okay, so, so, so here it is. So what I'm going to talk about, what do we do? We do fermion Monte Carlo. And, um, and then um, with this, we're going to, we do, it turns out that, you know, we didn't think that this would be the case at the beginning, but if you do fermion Monte Carlo, you can do spin systems and frustrated spin systems not too badly. And we do this by essentially um, you know, fractionalizing the spins into two fermions and posing the constraint exactly and seeing how far we can go. And so in this talk, I'd like to show you that we can, we can um, actually um, go down to 30 Kelvin or something like this, 30, 40 Kelvin for realistic models of, uh, of uh, um, um, uh, copper chloride, for example. And so this is, this is this part of the talk. And then the other part of the talk is also is motivated by some STM experiments, and that is what happens to a spin chain when you put it onto a magnetic, onto an, on a metallic surface? And that defines a condo type model, which is extremely rich. And depending on what type of surface you put your spin chain on, then you have, you know, essentially all, well, I'm a bit, I'm a bit exaggerating here, but a lot of the phases of condo lattice models. So that's pretty fascinating. And it's also something that you can, you can do experimentally. So that's a, that's a, um, some, the, the experiments which uh, motivated us were, were done in Delft, and then I'll conclude. So before I start, here are the people I work with. These are people in Würzburg. Uh, Marcin um, did, so the people who work on Kondo, that's Marcin, and Bim Ladanu, and uh, Zihong, uh, and also, also Toshihiro, and Toshihiro did the work on the Kitaev models. And we collaborate a lot, especially for the Kondo stuff, with Tarun Grover, Mat Matthias Voita, and Manuel Weber and David, David Lewitt, and you'll see why um, they, they have helped us a lot in understanding the physics of spin systems on, on, on metals. Okay, so let me start with the Monte Carlo. Um, so we do, the, the Monte Carlo we do can, can only work in thermodynamic equilibrium, right? So that's, that's all we can do, otherwise we will have a, a, big, a big phase problem. And the idea is, is, is in principle, simple. We have a, a many-body Hamiltonian, We'd like to you know, evaluate the partition function and we'll do this with a path integral and uh, we will split up the interactions with hubbard sotonovich field. So we will have a field which is space, I'll give you an explicit example afterwards. This is a field which is space and imaginary time dependent. This goes from zero to beta. And for each of these field configurations, we have an action and the, the action is, uh, is, is essentially um, describes a single body problem in an external, space and time field. So this action, if I give you a, a, a field configuration, this action can be calculated in polynomial, polynomial time. So you see that um, the Monte Carlo, so, so at this point, I think there was a lecture on Monte Carlo last week, if I, if I remember the program. Essentially this sum here, this integral, high dimensional integral will be done with Monte Carlo. And for each of these things, each of these field configurations, which I will sample, I can evaluate a weight. Of course, this is, so this is the basic idea, right? It's not very, it's, it's not very, it's, that's the idea. So here's an example. An example is um, we, uh, a Hamiltonian, generic Hamiltonian, which is written as a one body term and a sum of perfect squared. And we'll see that um, all the interactions we will have can always be written in sums of perfect squared. And um, so to, uh, if you have a perfect squared, you can do a Gaussian decomposition, you can do a Trotter decomposition first, so you slice up your time from zero to beta into small delta tau intervals. Um, you do your Gaussian integration to decouple this term, um, you know, with this, with this field. This was the field phi which I had before, and this couples to uh, this one body operator. 
So at this point here, you can integrate because all, this, the, all the, the operators are bilinear, somehow these are single body operators, you can integrate out the fermions here and you will get a huge determinant. Um, so the key point is, you know, how can we, it, it, does, does this work? Huh? And this will, this will only work actually if the determinant or the trace or this object here, the trace of this U hat is positive. And um, to, to show this, uh, normally people use symmetries. And so one symmetry you can use is to say, well, um, do we have, for the given problem we are looking at, do we have an anti-unitary uh, operator? So that's a unitary complex conjugation, uh, which squares two minus one, and that commutes with this operator U. If it does, then you can use something like Kramer's theorem. So this is, this is a one line proof of, of Kramer's theorem. Then you will see that the eigenvalues of this, I mean, you know, if once you do the trace, you'll get a matrix. The eigenvalues of this matrix comes in, come in complex conjugate pairs. So you will have no sign problem. Of course, there's a, there is a, um, there is a, there is a, um, a condition and uh, the condition, there's a condition, namely that there should be no anti-unitary operator. Also, there should be a U, um, a U1 uh, symmetry, which somehow tells you that this T on the vacuum gives you the vacuum again. So a, an example of this would be time reversal symmetry. So if you have any problem which, is, which has an attractive interaction like this, then you can show lambda is, is real, there's a minus, this is positive, then you, can have, you will have no sign problem, you can simulate it. So generically, we have no sign problem. Um, and then, the, so the argument, basically the phase of this determinant is zero. And if we have no sign problem, the computational time scales as the volume to the cube times beta. Yes. Yeah. So here you've taken the terms up to the lambda. So you are, uh, we are assuming the weak interactions here? No, 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 no. There are no weak interactions. There is, there is no condition on lambda. Okay. Right? So, so we will, it's not a perturbative, it's an exact method. Okay. Right. So it's just, you can, it, uh, it, there's no, no, you can, we will take U to infinity even. I mean, we will take some, it's a strong coupling. It can be a strong coupling method. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Okay. So um, the computational time scales as the volume to the cube times beta. And, uh, you know, the absence of sign problem is normally done because of symmetries. And there's a body of work there which tells you when you have a sign problem, when you don't have a sign problem. So pictorially, no sign problem means that we have pinned the phase of the determinant here to zero. Now, in general, you know, if we have no symmetries, like for first-rated spin systems, then the sign will be all over the place. I mean, so I will have no things, the, the, the phase of my determinant of phi will be all over the place. And essentially, what I will have to do is I will have to sample an, a different partition, a different action, which is the, just forget the, just like, like the phase of the determinant, and then I will have to compensate. And in the, when compensating, I essentially buy in my exponential factor because this compensation factor is like the, partition, like the quotient of two partition functions and it decays exponentially. There's a number alpha, which turns out to be important, important beta times the volume. So I have to resolve such a small, a, a small number. And because of the you know, law of large numbers, essentially the computational time will scale exponentially with like this, so, so, so it's bad. Huh? And so the question will be, um, the, the rule of the, of the game is here, um, if, I, if I cannot go to a no sign problem, can I find a trick to optimize alpha, right? And if alpha can be small, then I have a mild sign problem and I'm, I'm, I'm happy I can, go, I can go to low temperatures. So that's the trick. The point we try to do is the conjecture is to say, well, um, let's try to, you know, we can pin the phase to here, that would be no sign problem, but what we could also do is to find a formulation to pin the phase between zero and pi. And our conjecture, and we show that empirically, is that if you're able to pin, use any type of symmetries to pin the phase, then what will happen, you will get a, you will, it, it's, a, it's a way to optimize alpha. But, you know, a full-blown optimization of alpha is, is, is arbitrarily complicated because you would have to formulate your, your, your path integral over the whole possible set formulations, you know, et cetera, and then minimize. I mean, it can be, it can be a fun, I mean, if you like optimization problems, you're, you're, you're happy. I mean, see, people have tried, right? And sometimes it works. So um, before I go on, I, I see that I'm a bit, okay. Before I go on, here is a, we have a package. You can download it here, um, which does the Monte Carlo for you. Um, it's an extremely general package. Everything which I, which I present here 
can be done with this um, algorithm for lattice fermion package. I, I won't go to the details of that. These are the people who have uh, and are still working with me on this. Good. So let me let me start. I think I've. Uh huh. Good. So this is work done with Toshihiro um, on this phase pinning approach. And what we would like to do is to um, um, I try to see how far we can go with our method with the Kitaev Heisenberg Kitaev Heisenberg model. And the, the way to write it down for our Monte Carlo is in terms of these perfect squares. This term here is um, um, non frustrating and we will write it in this way, right? It's like uh, these, these D are, are, are written like that. So this is an exact mapping from here to here, provided that uh, you put yourself in the, so I went a bit too fast. We fractionalized the spin, not because of form for the spins. And then we put in um, the constraint. The constraint will be put in um, exactly um, so, so the formulation we will do, I'm sorry, the formulation we will do is to, first of all, enhance the Hilbert space, so we will allow for double occupancy, and then in the Hamiltonian we saw with quantum Monte Carlo, we put in a Hubbard U term, which, um, you know, fixes the parity of the electrons on the sites, okay, so we go from, you know, we restrict the Hilbert space energetically with this. So this term here will give you, uh, if you care, care, care to do the calculation, will give you exactly this term here, this D is the hopping of these F electrons of the Abrikoz of fermions. And this is the trick, the way to write um, the Kitaev part here, because um, on, the, on the physical Hilbert space, S squared is equal to a number. So I can forget that. And so if you carry, if you take the, if you do the, 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 the if you multiply this, then you will get this. So the claim is that if you, if you, if you take this Hamiltonian, you put it into, you do the hubbard sotonovich we have those perfect squares, et cetera, then you can show there is one at, I mean, you can, we can show, we show that in the paper, you can show that um, the, the phase is spin between zero and pi, right? So that's the, that's the, that's the formulation we have. There's one more thing is that, um, importantly, the fermion parity is a conservation law of this Hamiltonian so that the, um, you will very efficiently project onto the uh, physical Hilbert space. Right? So, so this is, these are the results. And so we, you, you know, there is this phase pinning method is a very special approach and you can do other approaches. So, so this is um, the, as a function of this angle phi, right? Between K and J, um, uh, as a function of this angle phi, this is the average sign, right? So the average sign is the worst for the, for the Kitaev parts, right? For the spin liquids, for the Z2 spin liquids parts. And if you put yourself at V equals 18, without any phase, uh, uh, phase pinning, you get this average sign here which is then rather bad. I mean, this is at a high temperature, so you, know, you won't go very far with, with, with this method. If you turn to the phase pinning, which is this one here, then you see a huge increase in the sign. So this is, this is a calculation which is actually very easy to do. And if you go, you know, you can go up to V72, right? 72 sites here, um, and you can still do your simulation. So this, uh, this, this, uh, this you know, embarrassingly simple trick gives you the opportunity to, um, to calculate, to go to pretty low temperatures. So as a rule of thumb, what we can do is if we, you know, is this, is this good enough or not? Well, if you look at the Kitaev materials, your A will be of the order of 10 electron volts, which is 100 K. And so we can arrive in general to beta A equals three on a 32 lattice, which gives us a temperature of 30 Kelvin, which is not, which is not bad, right? This is, this is relevant for experiments. We won't go to one Kelvin, but we will go to 30 Kelvin or something like that. So that's, that's, and we can then experiment, uh, uh, compare of experiments. So these are, um, to tell you that we go to low enough temperature to see the short range correlations. So this would be in the zigzag phase, this would be in the stripey phase. Uh, these are in the Kitaev phase, ferromagnetic Kitaev, antiferromagnetic Kitaev phase, where we see no correlation. So we do see signs, we can go to low enough temperatures to see signs of short range interactions. So let me give you, a, a, this is still work in progress, but let me let me give you a, an example of where, where we we are a bit. I mean, we we do hope that this method will be useful also for experiments. So you maybe have seen this um, this Hamiltonian for um, for ruthenium and copper um, uh, trichloride. Um, is that the so this is essentially we took this Hamiltonian from from the work of Winter and Allen also Jose Valenti essentially and, and, and many more right so the dominant coupling is the Kitaev there's the gamma there's a J1 J3 and also these um, these these D factors so we can we can use this phase pitting method to simulate this full model in um, in a magnetic field and the experiment we have chosen to compare with 
is what you call magnetic rigidity, or essentially the magne magnetotropic coefficient. And the idea is the following. You put your sample on a cantilever in a magnetic field, and the cantilever oscillates. It oscillates pretty slowly compared to the time scales within, the, uh, with the, within, within, within your crystal, so that it essentially captures the thermodynamics. Okay, so, so the, the, the things which the experimentalists measure, um, and that's Kim Modic in, 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 in Vienna, is essentially the second derivative of the free energy with respect to phi at phi equals zero, right? So this phi is the oscillation of the magnetic field around, you know, around an axis E. And um, you can work this out. This is a thermodynamic quantity, and you do the linear response, and you'll get this, this quantity. The beauty of this is that we can do the calculations, right? We can do the calculations um, for this, um, for, for this, for this, well, this model for this material. And what we see is that we can compare rather well with experiment, especially we can reproduce um, something which um, Kim has been calling scale invariant magneto and anisotropy. Um, and so what this is, is that if you plot the magnetotropic coefficient K divided by T and the magnetic field B divided by T, then you see that everything falls on a single curve, right? So this is sort of a scale invariant thing. And that also matches very well with the experiment. Huh? And uh, we can go down to 41 Kelvin here. That's the, that's the, that's the, lowest, the lowest we can get. So for the moment, we don't really understand where this, where this origin of the scaling comes from. We don't even understand if it's very deep or if it's just a, an accident or if it's, um, I mean, there's one case where you get scale invariant and that's essentially just a single ion limit, right? You just take a simple single ion limit in um, a, uh, with, a, with an anisotropic G factor, then you will get exactly this scaling. What is surprising somehow is that you are below the magnetic scale and you still see this right so this is something which we would like to understand a bit better by comparing with other uh with, with other uh, models etc so so hello uh sorry i have a question from online online yes yeah sorry uh, uh, i was just wondering if this magnetotropic coefficient is it sensitive to uh, long distance correlations or is it really about the short distance physics um, we don't know. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. This, this is a one go calculation. So the question, so this is a calculation with a J1, J3 here. So I don't know if that, uh, so that's the question. If it's sensitive, if I put longer range interactions, is that the correct, is that the question? Uh -huh. No, no. Okay. Uh, so it really captures the J3 correlators and the J3. Everything, the, uh -huh. the, the calculation we have done is really for the material. Well, uh -huh. the material seen from these papers, right? I don't know to what it, so this is just taking the taking the taking the the, the numerical the, the the values for the J1 J3 um, um, the the, the Kitaev coupling and gammas from these papers and doing the calculation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Quick follow-up question to this. So this is like with the Kitaev interaction. Right. So. Um, is it known? Is there anything specific Kitaev? So if I take like the system without Kitaev or put another yeah, so, isotropy like so, DM in, do I get? Yeah, so, so we're playing with things. We're playing with an anisotropic Heisenberg model with no frustration and we don't get this, right? You don't get We this. don't get this, right? So there's, very, there's, something, there's something special, right? Exactly what it is, we don't really know yet. But if you take a, a Heisenberg model with a ZZ, with an X, XXZ type interaction with a G factor, which is anisotropic, then you don't get this nice collapse, right? So it's not, it, it's, you, you get it for the KITAF, for this model. We, we don't have so many calculations. We had, yeah, so it's a bit slow. Um, we don't have so many calculations. What we, what we know is that if we change the angle, right? This is what, I mean, Kim has only one angle, but if you change the angle here, you still get the collapse. Right, so that's not angle dependent. Uh, if you change the model, you go to something which is non-frustrated and which generates, you know, anti-fermentative correlations. Then you do not get this. Right? So it's a, it is there's something special. I don't know if it's KITAF or just the lack of. I mean, what happens is that you don't have so many. The the the, the correlations stay very short range. Okay, and so since you wanted questions, so um, you do that. That goes on his time, not on my time. Okay. You do that in the standard uh, apricosa fermion approach, but yeah. the Kitaev model, you know, we know that it works very well in the Majorana yeah. representation. So, yeah. um, would you expect that the sign problem is, uh, you know, 
less work, uh, or yeah, less bad. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we didn't try that. We didn't make it. For, we didn't make it work with the with the Maranas. It's very. It's a good question. So, so it would be very. There are many different variants of this, uh, of, of this Monte Carlo. When there's also a projective method, so we could try to start with. Can we put in the exact result in, and then you know look at the perturbations around the exact result with Monte Carlo? So these are all things which are very good ideas which we're trying to work on, and try to optimize it. Try to know to you know take what we know from the exact limit and try, and try to perturb around this. That's still still that's yeah. Okay, we have to try this. This is, you know, this is just playing. We have a, you know, we're not very intelligent. You know, what we do, we just have a package. We just plug things in and it works. It does, that's it. It seemed to work for this, this way. That's all. Okay, thank okay. you. Good. So, so I'm, I'm going to be very late. Now I'd like to go to the other part of the talk, which is uh, spin chains on metallic surfaces. And so these are the two papers I'd like. That's, kind of, that's very, uh, uh, that's going to be very, very, very quick. Okay, so this is the this is the experiment which motivated us, and uh, this is a, a mod, an experiment which was done in, in Delft. And what they can do is 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 really remarkable. They have cobalt atoms um, on um, copper uh, one zero zero surface, and there is a there is a decoupling layer. So there's a small insulator between the the, the, the two D metal and the and the cobalt atoms. And um, so so these these forms um, condo type. Atoms, if you want, this is the, I, mean, I won't go into the details of the experiments, but essentially what they can do is to build this Hamiltonian, right? So this Hamiltonian is, um, um, these are two dimensional conduction electrons. These are here, this is the spin of the cobalt atom, which because of single ion anisotropy becomes a spin one half. This couples to the, to the metallic, to the metal conduction electrons. And you need, there is somehow, um, if you look at the experiments, there is a, there is a Heisenberg coupling between the magnet, ma magnetic moments of the, of, of the cobalts, right? And so if you take it, we know that this is the Hamiltonian which describes this paper, because with, with Frédéric and Bimla, we have done extensive calculations and we can really reproduce all, a lot of the STM results they have by using this type of Hamiltonian. So this is a Hamiltonian which, we, which can be realized um, in the lab. Unfortunately, in the lab for the moment, it can only be realized for nine atoms, right? And with open boundary conditions, so there's no translation symmetry. But nevertheless, it, nevertheless, it motivates the question, what happens if we have an infinite chain on a, on, a, on a metallic surface, right? So what they could do experimentally, infinite won't work, but what we want to get rid of the, would like to get translation symmetry, so we were thinking about a, a ring, if you want, on the metallic surface, something like that. And um, so it's, I believe, something which is experimentally feasible. And um, um, depending on how much time you need will give me, I will try to tell you that it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to look at. So here's the way we do it again. We do it with the because of fermions. Um, and I will, uh, so it's, it's the same game as before. Um, we, the, this, this exactly corresponds to this here. That's the hybridization matrix element. The Ds here, that gives us again, the spin-spin the correlations, and we will, again, um, impose the constraint with the Hubbard U. The U commutes with the Hamilton, so again, the constraint is very well imp efficiently imposed. And you can, you know, because, you know, this is, this is a, these are real data which shows you that we're not in a weak coupling limit, it's something strong coupling. This is the double occupancy, basically, how well we project onto the physical um, Hilbert space, right? So we can go down three or four orders of magnitude. So it's good as exact, right, this, pro this projection. Um, let me, I'd like to, before, before going into the results, I'd like to give you a, a nice way of describing the phases, the possible phases of a condo lattice. And there's a very elegant way of doing this by mapping the condo lattice onto a U1 gauge theory. That's, and that's what I'm trying to do here in five minutes. So um, the, the Monte Carlo we will do, and also the way which Patrick Lee uses, if you want, or, you know, many other people use this to map the condo lattice onto a U1 um, gauge theory is, well, let's do the hubbard to get To get to decompose this, I will need one complex field, which I call B here. To decompose this, I will need one complex field, which I called chi per bond. And to uh, impose the constraint, I will need a scalar field um, A0, a real field A0. So if you care to do all this, you take the Negli Orland book and you, you, know, you do all your stuff, then you will come to an action S, which is um, dependent on Grassmann variables and the fields you've plugged in here. And you will see that this is essentially a U1 gauge 
um, theory, right? I'll come back to this later. Uh, so this is, you know, the T here embodies the hopping. These are the fields you have put into here. This is the, this corresponds to this. This is basically the hybridization, F dagger C. And then this is the constraint, A0. Um, this is then the, um, I, I, the, the, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, right, in this U1 formulation. So uh, let me skip the next slide. We don't want that. Now, wh why is this, you know, when you do a path integral, right, you do a path integral, you can do it, you, th you can do it in many ways, right? And you have, you have no idea if the, you know, if you're doing, if you're capturing the correct low energy degrees of freedom, right? You really don't know. Now, in this case, we believe that we, 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 we would like to see some physics in the sense that these Fs and everything capture low energy physics. We do believe that this is the case because what we can do with the Monte Carlo is go to the large end saddle point. We can systematically simulate this thing for different values of n. That means n equals two. That's the physical case where I have essentially two components of this F. This is a spinor. I can go to n components and I can still do my Monte Carlo. And I can systematically go from n equals two to n equals infinity. And I will look, see what the saddle point is. This is the large end formulation of condo, condo models. And we will see that along this way, there is no phase transition, right? So meaning, meaning that the saddle point of this Lagrangian has something to do with the n equals two case, right? So that we can show numerically, which is you know, not actually non-trivial, right? If you come from high TC background, then this never happens in high TC, right? I mean, so this is, this is really something which is remarkable and works very nicely for the condo. So given this as a background, we can say, well, it's worth looking at this, this thing and trying to understand the condo physics from the point of view of a U1 gauge theory. That's the point. That's what I'm trying to get at. So we have um, symmetries in this action. We have, of course, global charge symmetry. So the C carry real charge. The F, these are agricultural fermions. They don't carry any charge, but they carry a U1 gauge charge, right? So if I, everything's invariant under a local, um, um, a, a local gauge transformation. Uh, and so, you know, this F carries a U1 gauge charge. That's why you have the, the, the U1. Um, that's, the, that's, that's basically the QED. Good. So now, how can we classify the phases? What is a condo phase? What is a heavy fermion phase? And the heavy fermion phase can be understood extremely elegantly from the point of view of this, um, of this, of this action. So you can, you can build a new fermion out of the abricals of fermion. So the abricots of fermion is not something which is physical because a gauge charge, so it will be completely localized. But what you can do is you can build a new quantity which you take the phase of this B here. So this has a gauge charge also. And so I cancel exactly the gauge charge here so that this object E of I phi and F is an object which has the quantum numbers of a fermion. So it has an electric charge and it has a electric charge and also has a spin, et cetera, but no gauge charge. Now um, you can, so what that means is that if I think in terms of this F tilde fermion, this F tilde fermion will be something which is, will be eternerant. And if the ground state is a Fermi liquid, then it will participate in the Lutzinger volume. So that, that's, what, that's what happens in the heavy fermion, essentially that what people say is that in the condo phase, you build this sort of composite fermion object, it's a fermion, and so it participates in the Lutzinger volume, you have to count it in the Lutzinger volume. So this is the this is you know what people mean when the spins participate in Lutzinger volume, and um, in the large end limit because I told you that this is adiabatic this goes adiabatically to the large end limit. Essentially, in the large end limit, what will happen is that this phase becomes stuck right in space and time, and this is essentially a Higgs type mechanism. So the condo heavy fermion phase is a Higgs you know corresponds to the Higgs me a Higgs mechanism for U1 gauge theory. There's one more thing which I would like to tell you is that. Working with this object is possible in the Monte Carlo, but it's very formulation dependent. And you'd like to go back to something which looks more like, um, you know, an operator in second quantization, which you can work with. And you can work it out that this object here is uh, corresponds to a to an operator psi, which is a composite object of a spin and the conduction electron. That's what we call the composite fermion operator. So you can persuade yourself that this really is something which which. Um, there's an emergent new fermion, if you want, which, uh, uh, which is generated when you go to low temperatures. And this is, this is for a test case for a square um, condo lattice model. If you go down as a function of temperature here, this is a spectral function. If you, if you go down as a function of temperature, then you see that you see, you see these very nice um, uh, uh, you know, dispersions, really quasi-particles which are, which are being formed. I won't go too much into the details, but 
in principle, this is, this is the signature, if you want, of the heavy fermion phase. So I spent a lot of time for this heavy fermion phase because that's actually the, the one which is trickiest because it's not based on type, type of symmetry breaking, right? It's a, sorry, it's a Higgs mechanism, so it's, it's hard to see. So now we can, we can sort of take this action and list all the phases we have for condo, for our condo, well, all the phases, at least some of them we have for the, for the, for the condo system. So we have a condo phase, a heavy fermion phase. So there is um, this Higgs mechanism. So I defined this with this B of R is not equal to zero. The gauge field is confined and there is no condensation. There is no SU2 symmetry breaking. We can have a spin density wave phase where you have a condensation of this, no Higgs mechanism, this is confined. We can have the combination of the two, condo and SEW, right? Where these things and this, these are, this is condensed, this, there's Higgs mechanism and the gauge field is confined. And then there are these star phases where the gauge field is deconfined. Here, there's nothing, um, no condensation of the Fs, no, um, this is a, yeah, this, um, this is what you call a condo breakdown phase. And then an SDW star phase, if you take a, a Z2 field, um, I think this could also exist. Um, I, I, we won't see this one actually, so I, I won't go into this. So you have a possibility to understand all these phases. And my claim is that those spin chains on metals, I know we won't have time to go to the end, but those spin chains on metal can capture all these phases here, not this one, right? So that's, uh, and, and transition between those, and transition between those phases. So that's the, my excitement, if you want, for these, for these uh, um, systems, spin condo systems on metals. So now let me go back to, after this long introduction, go back to the, to the actual work. And um, so let's start. This is my spin chain on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a Fermi surface. And then I can start looking at, looking at, the, um, looking at limiting cases. Huh? So the limiting case where, so JH is going to be a constant and I'm going to vary just JK. If JK gets very big, right, then I will form some condo singlets between the localized spins and the conduction electrons. And essentially this is a sort of, it's not really a trivial phase, but it's, it's, we can understand this phase pretty well. And the spins are screened by the conduction electrons and they will inherit the properties of the metal host, right? So this will be my heavy fermion metal. So this strong coupling phase is, is rather easy to understand. What is less easy to understand is what will happen at weak coupling when JK is small. And the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, if I take a spin chain and I put it on a metallic surface, will the spin chain remain a spin chain? Or will the metallic surface be a relevant perturbation to my spin chain? Right? That's the question you should ask, which is a non-trivial question. Well, for me, I did not know before we started this. So how do we go about understanding this? So we will assume that JK is small and now do some perturbation in JK. So this is a perturb perturbative approach. So we do a perturbation in JK, integrate out the fermions, and what you will get in your action, these are my spin coherent states, and you will get you will get a time and space dependent in displaced uh, displaced interaction, and this chi zero is just the spin susceptibility of my host metal. Now for this for this uh, Fermi surface, um, you can show that there is a there's a correction log squared correction which is not so important here. Um, chi zero, the local one as a function of imaginary time decays as one over tau squared, and if you put your chain in this direction the real space decays as one over R to the four. Now you can ask yourself the question, if I put myself at the, you can ask, put yourself, you said the question, if I put myself at the CFT or corresponding to the, to the spin one half chain, is this something which is relevant or not? So the DK one over R four is irrelevant, but the DK in space, in time, one over tau squared, turns out to be marginal, right? So we have a problem, right? It's not, it's, it's something which could, it could be marginal relevant and, and something can happen. So, so the, the weak coupling of this problem um, ask, poses a, a new question, which is what happens to a dissipative um, spin one half chain? So the question we will have to ask is the weak coupling, just, just the weak coupling, weak coupling aspect of this problem turns out to be rather rich. So this is a, now a detour. I have three slides for the detour and then I'll come back. So what we would like to understand is just the weak coupling by looking at a different model. We have the chain. And then just a dissipative interaction, right? Which is just in time, because the time was the, was, the, was the axis which was marginal, not the space. And so we have this now this alpha, which we would like to, to modulate. So this is work which was done um, by Manuel Weber, because Manuel was able, developed a very, very good algorithm to look at spin systems with retarded interactions. That's exactly what this is. 
So the Hamiltonian we have, which we will simulate, which corresponds to this action, is essentially the Heisenberg spin chain, right? Coupled to um, a boson, right? This is a, a vector boson. So this is as you, there's a there's a rotational symmetry, and we have many of these bosons. And the, the thing which is important to get the tau squared is that the 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 the, the, the dispersion or the the, the the dispersion of the of, of this of these bosons are proportional to omega that defines my omic path. Okay, so I, 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 will, I will I'll go slowly because I think this is an interesting problem. Um, if you you know if you take a spin and you couple it like this to bosons, you should ask yourself the question: Can these bosons screen the spin? And the answer there's a very simple answer to this, which based on the, on a conservation law, if you look at this Hamilton, there's a rotational symmetry which comes from the angular momentum of the bosons, which is here, plus the spin one half. So if you just take a single spin, right, just take I, just, just put I just to one, just put a single spin, then this will be always a half integer, which means that a bath cannot screen a single spin, right? So there's no screening in the weak coupling. The only thing that can, be, that can happen is that you will generate a spin, which is, you know, a bit heavier, which is more hard to move, and you will maybe um, um, order, but the bath cannot screen, and so the question will be, even in the strong coupling limit, when alpha gets very big, here when this alpha gets very big, you'll never have some screening. So then you have to go and go and do the numerics and see what, what, what happens. So these are the results which were, which were obtained by, by, um, by Manuel, and what he calculates are the spin-spin correlations around, along the chain, and to see if we have a long-range order or not, what we calculate is what we call a correlation ratio. So that's one minus S of Q plus delta Q. So that's two pi over L divided by S of Q. This quantity goes to one in an ordered phase. It goes to zero in a disordered phase. And that criticality, you know, if you have a, a, a scale invariant point, then this is a constant, right? So it's an RD invariant quantity. So what this plots is as a function of system size for different values of alpha, this correlation ratio R. And then you see you have two, you have two, um, you have two regions. This one, when alpha is big, this grows, right? And it seems to be growing up to one. So we say that when alpha is big, well, the dissipation will induce long range order. And then there's another region here where it goes down as a function of system size. And you say, well, there's no, there's nothing which is created. And so there's a characteristic alpha, you know, which will, which depends on the system side where things cross. And the, what you see is that this crossing here, where you go from order to disordered somehow, or critical maybe, um, this sort of goes down um, to zero. So it, it sort, of, sort of slips away telling you that maybe the interaction is marginally relevant. You can do another thing and you can look at this correlation ratio, but now fix the alpha and plot it as a function of one over L. And you know, if you have something which is marginally irrelevant or marginally relevant, what will happen is that you won't see it until low energy scales or large system sizes. And when you come to a characteristic system size, then you will see an effect. And so what, this is what this shows, is that if I take, for example, the, slow, the smallest alpha we have, 0.2, it goes down, right? It hits a minimum and then it goes up again. You can plot this minimum here, which is a change of, you know, you know, a, a change of, you know, basically you're, you, you go, you're attracted from one fixed point to the other in a certain sense. Um, then this crossover, this, this scale here, you can plot it as a function of one over alpha and you see that it grows exponentially, right? So you, you see that, what, we, what we've understood is that if you put a spin chain onto a metallic surface, it's like, you know, coupling a spin chain to an ohmic bath, locally to an ohmic bath, and it uh, generates long range order. So what we've learned is that dissipation is marginally relevant. Um, so we have a way of understanding this. In the I'm so sorry, but you are running out of time. So I know. Five minutes. One. I have five minutes. Uh, I know. So, so I'll skip this, but um, there is a very elegant way of, of understanding this. Um, the, the point is that this long range order chain has, uh, has um, Landau Dom Goldstone mode, so it's a z equals two um, uh, system where you, if you look at the uh, Bimla here, did a mean, um, a, um, we did a, a spin wave calculation, you have something which is like k squared here. Okay, so now let me go to, to this, I'll, I'll go quickly to, to this, uh, through this, through this result. I mean, you can read this here, we can discuss the whole week, I'm here the whole week, if you want. So, um, what we've learned is that dissipation and condo singlet formation compete and trigger an order disorder transition. That's the claim, right? So these are the results, um, namely that if you, um, if you look at the free energy respect to JK, there seems to be a, a transition, right? So this is now the full calculation for the full model. 
which is much harder because we have the fermions, not the spins. Um, if you put yourself at the critical point, right, more or less, then you look at the spin-spin correlations in space and in time. You see that there's a, in time, they, de they decrease as one over square root of tau. In, spin, in space, they decrease more or less like one over r. So that tells you that you have a dynamical exponent, which is maybe around two. You can use this dynamical exponent to do some scaling. You know, when you're at a critical point, you should scale the, system, the temperature um, as L to the Z, right? To stay at criticality, though this is, the, this is not to go to high temperatures. So this is what we do, we put Z equals two. And what we see is that, uh, this is admittedly a hard one, but we see that there is a crossing point here that this goes up. And because the dissipation is marginally um, relevant, we believe that if you go to two small values of J over K, we don't see anything. So we take this as um, a, um, a, a sign, a hint, that we have an order disorder transition. Right? Um, if we look at this two spin on continuum, this is the two spin on continuum would have for an isolated Heisenberg chain. So this we know uh, rather well. Um, and if you put in, you, you go, you put yourself in the magnetically ordered phase, and you remarkably, you see that, you know, this linear dispersion here acquires some type of K squared or Q squared uh, dependency. And these are my landau damp goldstone modes. Um, this holds also at criticality, more or less at JOK over at two. And then if you go to JK03 uh, in, the, in the heavy fermion um, phase, essentially you still have weight here, but you have much less weight in the sense that the, the F electrons, basically these are the spin-spin correlations, which you, which, um, which, um, which we, I mean, this is equivalent to looking at the, the bubble, if you want, of the, of these composite fermions. So this, the, the, the F electrons, they sort of start to, to, to dissipate, if you want, to participate in the, in the metallic uh, phase. So then the last point, I realize that this is very, very quick. The last point is the spectral function for this composite fermion. And um, remember what I told you about condo systems. If you, see, uh, if you see something, so this is in the ordered phase, this is in the heavy fermion phase. If you see some, um, if you see some uh, peaks here or some, some nice poles here, and that means that you have a well-defined heavy fermion, a composite fermion. So there's a Hig mechanism going on here, which tells us that the composite fermion survives across the transition. So that's the important thing to take away from this, from this plot. So this was quick, but what we've, what, we've, um, what, we've, what we've realized on this spin chain is a sort of health millets type transition, where on the left-hand side, you have an antiferromagnetic metal um, where you have order because of dissipation, where you have a heavy fermion metal, a magnetic metal, if you want, because there is a Hick mechanism. On the other side, you've killed the order, so you have a heavy fermion metal, n is equal to zero, but you still have the heavy fermion. So the understanding, you know, so this is, um, I, I, I don't have a, we don't have a theory for this for the moment. I think it would be very interesting to see if we can do that. Um, in the, I, I'll go on till you stand up. You, you're still sitting down. Perfect. Yes, you're standing up. Um, let me tell you that I told you that you can do the same thing if you change the substrate. This is you can go and look at this paper. If you put in, um, if you put in a Dirac a cone here instead of a of a full Fermi surface, then you also get a transition. But you get a condo breakdown transition in the sense that here you have um, nothing. The, the spin chain here. What I'm telling you here is that. If you put a spin chain on a Dirac system, then it stays a spin chain. It sort of effectively decouples from my Dirac system. So you can show this here. And then if the JK gets big enough, then of course this state uh, goes into a heavy fermion metal. So this blue point here, if you take this type of substrate, is a condo breakdown type transition, which is very interesting. And then here's my conclusion. Sorry for being late. Sorry, I'm not a very good chair. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you very much. For yeah, you're welcome. And um, now um, the session is open for questions. Uh, do you have a microphone there? Uh, I think we don't. Uh, we don't. We don't. I don't hear you. I'm sorry I didn't understand most of the things, but <laughs> about the, the, the chain, the spin yeah. chain on the metal. Right. And more a practical question. So if, if I was asked about a chain on the metal, my first thought would be, okay, the metal provides RKKY coupling, so it just modifies the Hamiltonian of yeah. the chain a bit. Correct. 
How how wrong is this is this point of view? How wrong? Yeah, it's completely wrong. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being very honest. I'm sorry. Because because you see that's that's pretty. It's a very good question actually, and that's the if you put in the if you look at the RKKY interaction, that's basically one over R to the four, right? That doesn't mess up your chain. If you put a Heisenberg chain and you put an R one over R to the four Heisenberg interaction, it doesn't mess it up. Oh, it's going to it's going to probably order. It's going to no 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 one over R to the four does not order. No. One over R to the four is irrelevant for the Heisenberg chain. Right? So that doesn't order. So that's what's, that's what's remarkable. It's not the RKKY interaction which drives it, but it's the time direction. The time direction, that's what messes it up. So it's dissipation-induced long-range order. It's not RKKY-induced long-range order. And then a second question, and a more experimental one. So in these uh, experimental realizations, how does the strength of exchange coupling that you have originally in the chain compare well, to dipolar interactions? Because okay, so so I'm not there, I'm not very I'm not a so I, how far away are the atoms one from another the the cobalt the, the cobalt ions? I have no idea. Well, I, okay, but you but, should look but at that. I should I should know many things, right? I agree. Uh, <laughs> uh, that this is I, I know that you can you can arrange it at different places so as to change if you want JH that I know right and the J there's a lot of study of these groups. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist, so I'm, I'm just repeating what I, 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 I glanced through, is that depending on where you put the cobalt, maybe that somebody online will know more, or somebody in the audience, depending on where you put the cobalt atoms, you can change the JH. That I know. Yeah, it's because, simply because uh, dipolar is uh, our cube, uh, and yeah. uh, it could be, could be relevant. Uh, it is, so, so, so what is our cube, you say? No, oh, the dipolar interaction. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Cube, so, yeah. So, so that is, yeah, that is a, so, so it's a, it's um, you know, it's it's. They're it's not a, messed up, unlike in sorry, and in one D they're not self frustrating like in three right. D. Right. So they they could be relevant. Yeah. So so the so what I can tell you is that I, I to be very honest I don't know how to I am not qualified to give you a, a model to to derive an ab initial model for this. This is too complicated for my thing, personally. Right. It's a, it's a, it's it's rather complicated. I think. But what I can tell you is that if you take this Hamiltonian, right, if you take this Bohr magneton separated by a known distance, an undergrad student can write down the Hamiltonian for that. Of course, you know the Hamiltonian of dipolar interactions. Yeah, but you need the single ion anisotropy because the cobalt is a three half. You have to know what the sign of the single ion of that anisotropy is. If but it's for not, the estimate, you, all you need to know is if it's about one Bohr magneton, it probably is, and compares the strength. Okay, so, so let me tell you, okay, so, oh, I'm so you, sorry. No, let me, let me, no, 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 uh, I'm sorry, you're the boss. You are a little bit out of time. I know. But if you want, you can just maybe. Please. We can, we can talk later. I'd be very happy to talk to you later. Sorry. All right. Work coffee. Yeah, yeah, sure. Work coffee, yes. Uh, we had another question. Maybe we have time for like one last question over there. I don't know. And the point where you said we move from the n equals to infinity to the n equals to two case for the fermion. Yeah, so this is the, um, a, so there's, the, the, essentially you will, you enhance the symmetry group from SU2 to SUN. Oh, okay, okay. That's all. Okay. And by enhancing the symmetry group, essentially what this does is to, this is a, this is a n component spinor mm. and you will go to um, bigger and bigger ends and, and that defines the large n saddle point. Okay. Right. So that's that. We we can talk about this more. Thank later. you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this statement that the large n is okay yeah. on the two D case. On the two D case. On the we check that for the two D case. Thank you for the question. That was a bit too quick. So we check that for the two D case. All right. Um, for fairness, I need to ask if there is a question from the online audience. If there is, then please unmute yourself and ask the question. Right. If no questions, then uh, I think uh, we are a little bit out of time. So let's thank uh, Maria and Sarah again. Nice